On the 2nd of July 1863, on the infamous second day of the three-day Battle of Gettysburg, Joshua Chamberlain, a relatively novice regimental commander, was ordered to take his unit, the 20th Maine, to the extreme left flank of the Union position and to hold their position above Little Round Top at all costs. Now at this point, Chamberlain had uh, only been in command of his regiment for about six weeks, but he'd led the 20th Maine in a desperate defence and received the Medal of Honour for, I quote, daring heroism and great tenacity in holding his position on the Little Round Top against repeated assaults. But of course his regiment, the 20th Maine, was not just made up of those men of the 20th Maine. Recently, they had received valuable reinforcements from the 2nd Maine, which I argue were critical in strengthening the 20th Maine and enabling them to hold their position against that attack. So who were these men of the 2nd Maine? How did they come to form part of the 20th Maine? And what is their broader story? In this video, I want to shed light on those men, those men of the 2nd Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Now, you likely haven't heard of the 2nd Maine before. They're not as famous as the Louisiana Tigers or indeed the 20th Maine, who have such a stellar reputation. The men of the 2nd Maine have a different story to tell. In fact, they probably fall at the other end of the spectrum in terms of these, these narratives that we hear. They're not often regarded as, as heroes, as uh, brave men holding the line. In fact, the men of the 2nd Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment are probably most well known, where they are known, for their protest, their mutiny, or their strike that took place in early 1863, mere weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg. So in this video, I want to cover the details on the 2nd Maine. I want to cover their incident in 1863. I want to explore what happened to those men prior to and during the Battle of Gettysburg. Now this first part of this video series will cover their protest in 1861, which sets the foundations for some of the mentalities and ideas that sparked this larger protest later in 1863. Now as their name suggests, the 2nd Maine were the second regiment formed in Maine during the Civil War. In response to Lincoln's earlier call for more troops for the Union Army, on the 22nd of April 1861, the Maine State Legislature approved the raising of 10 new regiments of volunteers to serve for two year periods each. This is important, to be raised to serve for two year periods each. The second Maine, which was already in the process of forming up from existing companies, was thus formed up as a two year regiment. And thus, in the early months of the war, the second Maine held this pride of place as the region's representative unit. They were the first to leave the state on active service, and because of the large number of recruits from Bangor and neighbouring locales, they became known as the Bangor Regiment. And during this early period of recruitment, the new recruits into the 2nd Maine signed several different types of enlistment papers. Some, particularly the earliest recruits, signed the existing 90-day militia papers, binding them only to a short period of state-based military, or really militia, service in their state for their state. They, along with other men who enlisted during the first few weeks of recruitment, would then be asked to sign an additional contract binding them to the two-year period of service as authorised by the state standard three-year papers. Now, of course, in, in these early years, these early months of the war, in their excitement to serve and defend the North, many men, similar to those in the first Maine, simply signed whatever papers they were given without a second thought. An account from Horace Hansen, who served with the gymnasium company in the second Maine, Recall the details surrounding this process, and I quote, Immediately after President Lincoln's call for 75,000 men for three months service, recruiting offices were opened in various parts of Penobscot County. Several existing militia companies volunteered, and many other companies were formed. The first papers signed were for three months. Soon after this call, the state authorised enlistment and organisation of 10 regiments for two years as state militia. The men who had signed the first papers were requested to sign the latter also, which they did. The second completed its organisation first and started for Washington before the call for three years men, expecting to answer the first call only. While in quarantine at Willis Point, a United States officer came to muster us in May 28, 1861, but declared he had no authority to muster in men for less than three years. Thereupon, a large part signed new papers for three years, but a considerable number refused. All started, however, for Washington. Now, the men of the 2nd Maine were, were promised that the three-year forms are really only formality and that they would only serve for two years with the regiment, a two-year regiment. 
It is also possible that some of the men were even of the understanding that they were still bound by their 90-day papers and they could leave at the end of that period. This agreement was, was widely acknowledged at the time. For example, a report in the Bangor Daily Whig and Courier newspaper from the 7th of June 1861 noted, and I quote, by a clerical mistake, they were ordered to be mustered in for three years when they arrived in New York, but it was subsequently rectified by a clerical error, and this was rectified, it reports. So while many signed their three-year papers out of eagerness and excitement at this early period of the war, others were undoubtedly pressured to sign, either by their officers or their peers. Now, a letter written on the 20th of March, 1863, by Alva Bates, a chaplain in the Second Maine, suggested that not all men signed their papers willingly. Bates argued that the men who signed the three-year papers in 1861, and I quote, cannot see it justice inasmuch as violent threats were used to induce it in many instances. I think the boys decided loyal and willing to serve their country to the last, but exceedingly sensitive about their rights, especially since the Seventh have had their privileges of going home as a regiment. Note, violent threats were used to induce it in many instances. Likewise, on the 7th of June, 1861, John Bridges, whose son Charles was serving in B Company of the 2nd Maine, wrote to Governor Washburn on behalf of his son, and John complained that his son, and I quote, had enlisted as he supposed for three months, but subsequently did not want to back out and put his name down for two years and wanted him to sign for three years at New York, but he did not want to sign and he does not like the drinking of much of the field officers, and he's got uneasy and would like to get a discharge and come home. Now, John Bridges' letter makes it clear that his son Charles felt pressured by the circumstances and, I quote, did not want to back out. But Charles, perhaps already feeling a sense of regret, refused to sign for three years and subsequently sought his father's assistance in gaining a discharge. Now, whatever these men had signed on paper, they were largely of an understanding, based on verbal promises made by officers at the time, that their service was to be either 90 days or, in most circumstances, two years, tied to the service period of the regiment, two years. As I noted, the local newspapers reported on this belief, and in early June, they further reported that, and I quote, the Bangor Regiment, the second main of volunteers, is among the troops mustered into the United States service for three months only, under the original call for 75,000 men. At the end of that time, they can return home or re-enlist. Now, there's a possible error here, but certainly this conveys the broad understanding that these were seen as initially a sort of three-month militia period, which was extended to two years in federal service. Now, the innocence, the inexperience, the perhaps we could argue, naivety of these men contributed towards their sense of reverence and ultimately their decision to resort to protests against military authorities when they felt that there was a breach in that agreement, a breach in their understanding, a breach in what they felt they had been promised by officers. So, on the 14th of August, 1861, shortly after the end of that 90-day period, about 200 men within the regiment ceased work and demanded they be allowed to return home. Now, that incident would test the citizen-soldier assumptions of those men. The Bangor Daily Wigan Courier reported at the time, and I quote, A portion of the 2nd Main Regiment have been pleading that they could not be held for service more than three months under the terms of their enlistment, and have therefore refused to do duty. As in the case of the 79th, a strong force of infantry was marched to their camp, and peace soon followed. 62 of the disorganisers were arrested and placed under guard. It appears that the plea of the men is that all volunteers are militia, and therefore, they cannot be made to serve more than three months at a time. It is almost needless to say that after the volunteers are mustered into the service for three years, the plea is absurd. Of course, this contradicts the earlier reports of the Bengal Whig and Courier. And it really uh, demonstrates the confusion amongst both the media and the men and their officers about exactly what the terms of this agreement were. As the report makes clear, though, the central issue was that the men believed they were not regular soldiers. They were merely volunteers initially for state service akin to the militia, and thus they could not be held more than regular militia service periods. Horace Hansen's account once again sheds light on that incident in 1861. He wrote, and I quote, At the end of the three months, the men who had not signed the long-term papers expected, and some demanded, their discharge. They had answered the First Corps, had participated in the Battle of Bull Run, and sighted the First Regiment, which had been sent home without having been in battle. Some 66 men, finding they could not gain a discharge, refused to do duty, and these, together with some New York men, in a similar predicament, were tried by court-martial in a lump. In line with the report in the Bangor Daily Wigan Courier, Horace's account attributes the cause of the protest primarily to an issue with enlistment papers, and with expectations of exactly what that contract meant. 
These men felt bound by an agreement with military authorities, and they felt those authorities should honour their part in that agreement. However, there were background factors contributing towards their decision to protest on this occasion. The men had recently, of course, on the 21st of July 1861, suffered a defeat at the Battle of Bull Run, during which they were, according to report from the Assistant Quartermaster General, and I quote, pretty badly cut up, having lost 150 men. The Confederate victory in that battle, following uh, previous expectations of a Union victory, resulted in a large Union retreat that demoralised the Northern soldiers. Reports from the 2nd Maine at the time indicated that, and I quote, our boys, owing to fatigue, ragged, ragged clothes, no money, and so forth, are not in the best of humour, as may be supposed. Time alone will heal the present shock. But the men were not given the time they needed. Instead, after the retreat from battle, the 2nd Maine were based near Fort Corcoran, described by their lieutenant colonel as located on a miserable and unhealthy spot, which during a rain is hardly affordable. Another described it as, I quote, not a very healthy location and not troubled with extreme neatness. In addition, the unit was low on supplies, particularly food and clothing, and many had lost their packs during uh, their, their hurried retreat from Bull Run, including their personal belongings. Frustrations among the rank and file then were further exacerbated at the time because their officers were trying to convince them to replace their two-year papers with these new three-year papers. This was poor timing. The men had just suffered a defeat in battle, a long retreat. They had lost their, uh, their packs, including their personal belongings. They were low on supplies and were camped in a miserable location with little to do. And then on top of all this, officers were trying to convince the men that they should serve for a longer term. One soldier in the regiment, Stephen Dawson, an 18-year-old mariner upon enlistment, reported in a letter home to his parents, and I quote, All we do is stand guard formation, no clothes, no money, and not half enough to eat. As Horace Hansen's account suggests, the men of the 2nd Maine also contrasted their situation with that of other men in similar units. At the first Battle of Bull Run, the 2nd Maine was part of Erasmus Keyes' 1st Brigade, alongside the 1st Connecticut, 2nd Connecticut, and 3rd Connecticut. All three of those Connecticut regiments were formed in late April or early May 1861, around the same time as 2nd Maine. The men of all four units enlisted at the same time during that period, and all had left their home states at roughly the same time. In fact, the 2nd Maine departed their home state several days before the men from Connecticut. Uh, the 2nd Maine, as I mentioned, even departed Maine before the 1st Maine did. Horace Hansen noted in his statement that the protesters cited, protesters cited the, the first Maine who had returned home and were mustered out. Why then, these men of the second Maine wondered, were their comrades who had enlisted at roughly the same time, who were of similar regiments and who had fought alongside in the same brigades, being returned home to their families and friends after their 90 days of service when the men of the second Maine were forced to continue fighting? Robert Carter, in his semi-biographical history, also provided the evidence that this was a key reason for the protest by arguing that, and I quote, having enlisted during the first excitement for two or three years for the war, when they saw the three months regiments returning home after the disastrous Battle of Bull Run, their dissatisfaction broke out in open mutiny. These various issues played on men's minds, and clearly, although the direct cause of the protest was the end of their 90-day period and a sense of injustice at not being allowed to return home, there were other factors contributing towards their resentment of the authorities and their decision to protest. Approximately 66 of the men maintained their protest and were ultimately arrested. They were initially imprisoned and threatened with hard labour for the duration of the war, but on the 4th of October 1861, they were unconditionally pardoned by Lincoln and transferred to the 2nd New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Several months later, on the 31st of July 1862, they were transferred back to their original unit, the 2nd Maine. But within the 2nd Maine, the immediate impact of that protest was the improvement in working conditions. New uniforms were issued in September 1861, and the supply situation rapidly improved. The message really received by both the protesters and their comrades in the 2nd Maine was that protests, particularly of the type utilised on this occasion involving the peaceful withdrawing of labour, while potentially damaging to the men involved, could be effective for their units. Thus, this protest of the 2nd Maine in August 1861 established an important precedent for their subsequent protest in May 1863.